On the 23rd of November in 1985, Debbie was approached by a man in the grocery store. The man, noticing Debbie's name tag, mistook her for an employee and asked her for help locating the tapes and records. Debbie then told the man that she had absolutely no idea and went back to her shopping. Debbie's name tag was from a local pharmacy she just recently started working for, and she was currently shopping for their supplies. A few days later, she would receive a call to her work from the same man. He introduced himself as Tony Adlington, and explained that he was the man at the store that had asked her for help. He followed up his explanation by asking her out on a date. Debbie, who was quite surprised by this turn of events, stands and contemplates. Her first marriage didn't end well, and she didn't want to have to go through it all again. However, she reluctantly agrees. Their first date ended up going well, and Debbie learned a lot of facts about Tony Adlington. He grew up in Rhodesia, modern-day Zimbabwe, where he had also served in the military. After Tony had finished school, he began studying accountancy. It was at this time that Tony shared a flat with Robbie Finch, a good friend of his. Debbie and Tony hit it off, and would spend most of their time at Tony's flat in Durban. It wasn't long before Tony asked her to move in with him. Debbie felt unsure about giving up her flat, especially since she'd have to give up her pet bird as well, since Tony didn't want him in his flat. She agreed to move in with Tony, but still kept her flat as a means of keeping her bird. She would, however, eventually give up her flat, and Tony agreed to take the bird in, but only under the condition that he stay in his cage. Debbie ended up giving her bird to her mother, believing that it was the best for him. But only a few days later, the bird had flown away. It quickly became apparent that Tony was incredibly stubborn, and preferred to make decisions that suited his own needs above anyone else's. His friend that he shared the flat with described Tony as serious and always in control. Debbie says that she had always been fairly independent, and perhaps this constant suppression of her own will made her feel like she was losing a piece of herself. She said that most of the time it was easier to just keep the peace and go along with it. Tony had bought an empty piece of land and told Debbie that he was going to build a dream house there. Debbie eagerly gave her input and opinions regarding what she would like to have in her own dream home, but she soon realized that it was more Tony's dream home and every suggestion she made was immediately shot down. Debbie later stated that there were almost never joint decisions in their relationship, and Tony always had the last say. In February of 1987, Tony would tell Debbie that he was being transferred to Johannesburg, and instead of asking her to join him, he simply assumed that she would. Debbie, obviously shocked that he didn't even ask her if she wanted to come, decided once more that she would rather keep the peace. In Johannesburg, Debbie got a job as a secretary, while Tony worked as a director. They briefly returned in 1988 to get married in Durban. In 1989, they moved to the East Rand of Johannesburg, and on the 11th of January in 1990, their first child, Kevin, would be born. Although Tony was never physically aggressive towards her, she claimed that his strategy was more psychological, and the emotional abuse was unbearable. Tony made sure to always keep up this impression of him being the dominant one and that he can become a threat at any given moment, should she be a hair out of line. Debbie claimed that during her first pregnancy, Tony was a lot calmer and looked happy to be a father, and was by all means a great father to Kevin, but the cracks were forming. Tony was slowly becoming almost detached from them, and as he was always incredibly private and secretive, he never told Debbie about what was going on. On the 29th of August in 1991, their second child was born, a little baby girl they named Caitlin. Even though he became less and less eager with each new child, he was at this point still according to Debbie, a good father to his two children. After the birth of their second child, they decided that it would be best if Debbie quit her job and became a stay-at-home mom. The idea was most likely put forth by Tony and seeing as how he and he alone managed all of their finances, he knew that at this stage they could afford to. Although looking back at it now, it may have been another attempt to strip Debbie of her final bit of independence. Tony allegedly switched jobs very frequently and abruptly, and with his being the only income, it undoubtedly placed enormous pressure on them financially. 
But seeing as Tony never let Debbie handle the finances, she most likely was unaware at this stage. In 1992, Debbie fell pregnant again, now with their third baby. Tony was allegedly very upset about this. Perhaps he was struggling to keep them financially afloat, or maybe Tony was starting to realize that his control over Debbie was starting to fade, as she gave most of her attention to her children. On the 1st of December, their second baby boy was born, who they named Craig. Debbie stated that there was a clear change in Tony's mood towards Craig compared to his other two children. Only a few months after Craig was born, Tony once again announced that he was being transferred and the whole family would be relocating, this time to Cape Town. Debbie had allegedly voiced her concerns about relocating the family and again disturbing the stability that they had built up. Debbie wanted to stay, but Tony wanted to go. Next thing, they were in Constantia, in a house of Tony's choosing, of course. As the children got older, they eventually would beg their parents to get a puppy. When Tony saw the puppy that Debbie had picked, he immediately took a disliking to him and made her return it so that he can pick one personally. Tony also stated that the puppy would be named Hazel, and thus she was. Debbie grew to like Cape Town and enjoyed their time there, but Tony had become more irritable. Tony wanted his way in every situation without compromise. Debbie's mother had noticed during her visits to their home that Tony had become extremely domineering and would overreact to any slight inconvenience. She recalls one of Debbie and Tony's visits in Durban, stating that Tony had bought a newspaper with a magazine inside. While Tony was paging through the newspaper, Debbie's father picked up the magazine and started reading. Tony allegedly didn't say a word, but the event left him so enraged that he got up and instructed Debbie to start packing, stating that they are leaving immediately a week before they had initially intended. In 1996, Debbie got pregnant again, now with their fourth child. Tony was obviously very displeased, as he immediately demanded that she get an abortion. Debbie refused, but Tony pressured her incessantly, which eventually led to Debbie having a miscarriage. After Debbie's failed pregnancy, Tony's abusive behavior started escalating. He would shout at Debbie in front of the children and constantly lift his hands, pretending that he's going to hit her, though he never actually did. Tony seemed to enjoy invoking fear in those around him. Debbie stated that Tony would often wait for the children to fall asleep before sneaking into their rooms and scaring them. Tony had always been a very secretive and controlling person, especially when it came to their finances. As stated before, Debbie was never allowed to handle the finances and never paid any of the bills. Since this was the case, she was unaware that Tony was on a downward spiral, both mentally and financially. Tony had announced that he sold their home and that they would once again be moving, but this time to Marina de Gomo. Debbie was no doubt livid, since he once again insisted that they move without even consulting her. On their last day at their home, Debbie had decided to prepare them all a special meal as a kind of final farewell. Allegedly while setting the table, Tony had loaded the children into the car and took them out. When they returned, they were holding packets of sweets and drinks that Tony had bought them. Tony would watch Debbie closely to see her reaction. She was completely disheartened. All the time that she spent preparing food for them, wasted, as no one was hungry anymore. Even though Debbie wasn't happy about having to once again move, she focused on the fact that Marina de Goma would provide the children with the perfect environment to have fun and play outside while still being safe. In the months prior to their murders, Tony had begun displaying very odd behavior. Debbie would say that she woke up at night to Tony standing at the foot of their bed, and when asked what he was doing, he simply told her to go back to sleep. During this time, Debbie had lost her best friend to cancer and would tell Tony that she thinks she should leave. Tony responded by telling her that she shouldn't think about taking the kids from him should she leave. Join us again for part 2 where we'll go over the events that happened that fateful day in January of 2002. Until next time.